Then I'd like to welcome to the stage Martijn, Martijn Rutten. Thank He's going to talk about multi-core programming and all kinds of stuff that's going to blow our minds. Take it away, Martijn. Thank, Thank you. you. Basically, I'm going to talk about bugs. Nasty bugs. Anybody ever wrote a C program in his life? Well, that's good. Then you're in the right place. I'll show some C. Um, I would like to take you on a little quest, a quest of programming multi-cores, multiple processors on a chip. And uh, you'll get to the swamp that the current market is in, the challenges that engineers are facing in doing this, and the things that come at you. And of course, at the end, there's a holy grail of automatic tools that do everything for you. So multi-cores, uh, if you look at the amount of sand or silicon in the world, and there's plenty of that, um, so we will see lots of more processors on chips um, coming up. Lots of processors means lots of processing power, and the question is, how do you deal with that? Who has a Samsung phone? Right, so the Samsung went in three years from a single to actually an octa-core, so a quad-core, octa-core, eight processors on a chip. Tremendous amount of processing power. And the question is, well, how is that going to be used? And so Qualcomm did a little study and said, well, actually, it's not used at all. 97% of the time, out of these eight processors, six are just standing still. And so you bought in Dutch a uh, cat in the zak, cat in the bag, I guess. <laughs> um, and so it's not used. And uh, the, those two remaining cores that are used are actually used pretty heavily. Eh? You know, your, your phone being so hot it burns through your pocket. Uh, batteries draining in a few hours. Uh, so what's going on? And this guy knew. Anybody in the D who this is? <laughs> right, Steve Jobs, right? Um, so when he was young, he already dreamt this up. He said, well, actually, nobody knows how to program these things. So anybody owning an, owing an iPhone? Owning? Right? Yeah, so actually that's smart because an iPhone only has a dual core, two cores, because you can't program more than those. And so you can have eight cores, but if you can't program it, then well, two actually is good enough to have a responsive and fast phone. So what does uh, Samsung and Qualcomm and LG with all their octa cores in their phones, actually nowadays it's 10 cores by MediaTek, what do they do? How do they get away with that story? They cheat. So I think the, the mobile guys were way ahead of Volkswagen in creating what in Dutch is known as uh, Schumel software, uh, fake software to cheat the benchmarks. Because yeah, if you can't beat them in raw processing power, you have the power, but you can't use it, then uh, well, better cheat. So it's hard. It's hard to program a multi-core processor, the parallelism, and the question is how do you do that? Um, so let's throw some code at the screen. This is C code for those who are not uh, recognizing it, and now we have four parallel threads of execution running on a nice quad core somehow. And here I have, uh, I initialized variables x and y to zero, thread one and two, set them to one, and uh, thread three and four read. Now this is techy. Anybody has an idea if in one execution of this program, uh, both prints, x first and y first, could happen? Who thinks it could happen? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, who thinks it cannot? It cannot happen, nobody. Okay, so six people are listening. Thank you very much. Um, actually, that's true. The answer is slightly different still. Uh, how does this work like this? Well, does it work? Well, sometimes. Most of the time it does, sometimes it doesn't. The answer to this is these two, two prints can happen on a mobile phone that has processors made by ARM, but if you would run the same program on a PC with Intel processors, it cannot happen. Only one of the two prints will happen at the same time. Does anybody know why that could be? Some idea? I have to give you a mic, I'm afraid. But, uh, <laughs> all right, let me give you, uh, uh, explain that in some techy sense. Uh, so in case that X and Y are written, that's all nice and good. But let's say that thread one and three run on one processor and thread two and four run on another processor. 
then one and three, they have local memory uh, associated with the processor. So they write X and they immediately see that. Uh, so that one and three, X is written, X is read, great. Y is not read yet, uh, written yet, so that's still zero, so this one prints. A moment later, this one goes on two and four on the same processor. So Y is immediately seen that that's written, so yes, that's true. And this one actually was written, but it never arrived at the other processor because it's still stuck in memory somewhere, huh? stuck in a traffic jam to memory. And so that one will also print. Now on Intel, they made sure something that's called sequential consistency, that that would not happen and that the ordering is, is maintained and that if X is written, it also arrives in that thread four. On ARM, they said, well, you know, the C standard doesn't say that you have to do this, so forget about it. We'll just ditch that expensive hardware, make a nice cheap phone, and that some programs will crash because the programmers didn't know about sequential consistency. Well, yeah, that's not our problem. So does it work most of the time? So in fact, the only way to program these devices is, is if you're some kind of Navy SEAL or Israeli combat team and you really know what you're talking about, which is not very scalable. And actually those guys also don't have a clue how to program that. Uh, here's a tough example. Anybody know C++ 11, latest standard? One, two. Uh, well, let me explain a little bit what's going on in this program, especially the amazing syntax. Does this thing have a pointer? Uh, not really. Um, so at the top, we create a set out of the standard template library. You know, a set we call bucket, and then we have a main program. And in the program, we immediately spawn off a thread uh, that runs on a separate processor, nicely parallel, and with all the syntax mumbo jumbo, uh, basically means that in that thread I'm going to insert the value five in my set. And then later on in the main thread, so which runs in parallel to that that other one, I'm going to just look into the set and see if I can find the number three. Oh, do you think you can actually find that? Guess not, because I inserted five and there's nothing else in there, so the, the three is not going to be found. So the normal operation of this program is to return, oh, sorry, I couldn't find it. If you run this 10 times, that's what it will do. If you run it 100 times, that's what it will do. If you run it 101 times, it will crash and probably break your computer while doing so. Any ideas why? The same guy still, I think he's, he's one of those. Uh, you used to be a Navy SEAL, right? <laughs> so. This goes wrong, and that's very, very, very tricky. This program looks totally fine. But it goes wrong when you insert into a set. A set is a sort of a tree structure. And the moment you insert, you change the tree structure. You're basically moving data from one other part. And if at the same time, in a parallel thread, you're then reading into that structure while it's being moved, you can imagine that you may end up at some part in the tree structure where there's nothing in your read from stale data uh, in a memory location where things go totally wrong if you start reading from there. So very nasty means that actually the standard library that makes this set is not ready for multi-core. And there's a way you get around it. You can get another library that is thread safe, but as a programmer, it means you have to know what you're talking about and have to be that same Navy SEAL again. So this is a, a typical example of uh, a data race. Uh, as well as uh, a Heisenberg, after the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. So if you look at such a bug, it's gone. Uh, you can't actually observe the bug in a debugger while it, uh, it happens, because if you start observing it, your timing changes, bug is gone. Uh, I guess anybody knows that if you, for instance, you have a car with a lot of software in it, and uh, the car tells you all of a sudden something terrible wrong, stop the engine, you restart the car, nothing wrong. You bring it to the garage. They said, well, sir, I have no idea what's going on. It looks all fine. And a month later, the same thing happens. Heisenbergs. So actually, this is a car example. In the 2005 Camry model of Toyota, I had a major recall a few years back. They spent about a million in recalling cars because they could accelerate unintendedly. And then NASA looked at the software and said, well, that doesn't look good. And then the bar group, a bunch of experts in Silicon Valley, looked at the software in a s secret room where they only could get to see the Toyota software. And they found a whole set of Heisenbergs and nasty bugs. 
uh, actually all of these could corrupt the memory and could break down the system and do nasty things with the car. Um, for instance, a race condition similar to what I just shown. So this is real, this happens in uh, all kinds of codes uh, from uh, jet fighters to cars to uh, uh, thermostats to remote controls, etc. So the question is, how do you safely program these things? And the logical answer would be, well, you know, start from scratch, write in a nice programming language like Rust or Go, Google Go, something that's made for multi-core and for parallelism, and, uh, and you get all kinds of nice properties. You don't have things like pointers, so you can't screw up the way you do in C, uh, which is a great idea. But then if you start looking in the industry, then a in 2009, they estimated that a high-end car has about 100 million lines of code, which is mostly C code, actually. By now, that's around 400 million. And then I'm not talking about a self-driving car, which is going to blow up that number even larger. Uh, Joint Strike Fighter, 24 million. Uh, the web browser in your phone, the Android browser, 8 million, roughly. Uh, super complex. A typical programmer, now you guys are all special, you can oversee maybe 10,000 lines of code and understand what's going on, maybe 20 if you're really good, but not much more. Statistics also say one in a thousand lines roughly holds a bug. Uh, I don't want to have that jet fighter flying over Amsterdam loaded with bombs knowing that statistics. Eh? And at the same time, this kind of code is built up over years and years and years. Uh, 15 years easily, patches on patches, and then if you want to structure this and break it down in separate pieces that you can run in parallel, for instance, the web browser on your nice quad core from Samsung, you can imagine that that's actually pretty tough. So what to do about it? And so, well, if we cannot do it, and, uh, then maybe we should ask the computers to, s to solve it for us and have tools. And actually, this guy said, yeah, well, the only way to do it is to uh, have tools to solve the problem. So in our company, we made tools to parallelize existing C and C++ code. Um, that's sort of the holy grail. So we actually didn't do that. We visualized the code, how it behaved, and then the programmer could interactively parallelize because automatically it was way too difficult. But so let's take a bit smaller step and let look, let's look at least at tools that prevent you from making bugs in programming these things. So if you looked at uh, compilers uh, parallelizing a little bit, uh, but also give you lots of warnings and errors if you do things wrong. In the industry, especially for instance automotive, you have coding standards like MISRA that basically say, well, throw away half of the, the possibilities from the language. And if you are in a straight jacket like this, and this is how you write your code, then you're probably going to make less mistakes. Uh, and we have automatic checkers to, to make sure that you get hundreds of messages that you all have to fulfill before your code is uh, compliant. And you can write lots of tests and there's frameworks to help you do that. You can do a static analysis. That's more like looking at the code uh, like, a, like a reviewer would do and then finding things like code duplication, uh, um, buffer overflows, uh, that kind of errors that, that you can see statically. And what we did actually was um, create a dynamic analysis tool which looks at the software while it executes, and then you can find these things like data races and other Heisenbergs. So is any of these tools a silver bullet? Well, not really. Uh, the, the Mars rover or Mars lander, I think, they obviously these guys need to make the software secure. It's a bit of a waste if you send that whole thing to Mars and then it crashes because there's a little bug in it. So they found out that they had to run four static analysis tools to get some decent coverage of bugs. Now, why is that? These tools, they look at the code, but they don't know, they have to sort of guess how it behaves. And so the only way, uh, basically what they want, they have to avoid that they guess wrong and give reports to developers of bugs that actually aren't there because developers hate that. And so they are careful and they prune all kinds of paths and say, well, here we're not sure, so better not report that. And each tool does it in a different way, with as a result that there's very little overlap in the uh, reports these tools give. Another example, a simple example. I have two arrays of two elements, one zero uh, initialized and the other one with my pin code, at least the first one. 
and then I have a little function that uh, reads from the array at a certain index and my main basically passes the index. Is there anything wrong with this program? Who knows? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I need microphones here. Yeah. Anybody wants to tell? Uh, you're reading out of bounds. Of yes, the, correct. Of the index. So what happens, I pass foo2 here, the 2 gets into this index, I read a2, and if you start counting from 0, that means instead of reading from the first array a, you read in the next memory location, and by any luck, that happens to be b, if that's nicely allocated after each other, and the program returns my pin code, which is not really what I wanted it to do. So that's an out of bounds access. Now, if you would compile this with, let's say, GCC, the standard C compiler, in debug mode, because you're still experimenting with your code, it wouldn't complain, it would compile a program, the program would happily run, and if you don't pay attention, it would return my pin code. If you compile this same program with GCC, but then in release mode, let's say with optimizations enabled, this program, uh, the compiler will, will warn you and say, hey, there's an out of bound access, and you shouldn't do that. So, and uh, why, why does it do that? Why in debug mode you don't see it, in release mode you do? Any ideas? No idea? Because uh, this kind of optimization would take too long? No, it's the optim one, once you optimize, it starts complaining. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. No, so what happens is that uh, the opt one of an optimization to increase performance would be that they say, well, you know, this whole function is so small, why don't I just put it right here immediately in here and then I inline it as it's called, which basically says that the compiler sees that and replaces this whole function call just with returning A2. And that's just then all of a sudden such a local scope, the compiler sees, hey, A, a at index two, yeah, but that's not right, and it can report. The moment that it's outside in a separate function, the compiler needs to understand this function and that function, understand that these have something to do with each other, and that's too difficult for the static analysis to get it right. So, oh, tools is a tough issue in that sense. <laughs> um, so we went out and we made a tool based on dynamic analysis to detect these kind of bugs and warn the developer before it's too late. And so we had a nice startup, we had investors, and the investor says, well, how are you going to make us lots of money? And that's what investors do. And so we went out to sell this tool, and uh, given that this is you know, also startup fest and everything, let's talk a bit about the startup side of selling tools like this in the market. So we would put on a nice tie, go to companies like TomTom Tom or... Uh, uh, Thales for uh, you know safety and uh, Philips uh, still the lots of software going on in there or Volkswagen because these guys have software issues um, and we would tell them about their great tool and they would say well yeah sounds great but uh, show me because I don't believe this actually works because we've seen other tools and none of them work so you go in, in for free because you don't get paid by these guys to do that then you install the tool um, you, you compile the software with our tool, and in, in this case what we did is we instrumented the code while compilation, while compiling, then execute it on some embedded platform, uh, gather lots of data from the execution, run our analysis algorithms on it, and a report comes out with bugs. And you go for lunch, and then with the developer you walk over the, re uh, the report of bugs, and if you're a bit lucky the developer finds bugs that, he, uh, that would have killed persons or uh, closed the business, and then they show it to the boss and uh, you get lots of money. That's the ideal case. Now for practice. Uh, looking back, uh, so we flew to uh, Samsung in Korea. Uh, I had to wear a nice suit and hand over my business card like this and then we got in and we had to prove this. And then they said, oh, please run this on Chromium and, and Android. So Chromium, eight million lines of code, 106 repositories, um, 33 compilers actually shipped with the project, just C++, just because they wouldn't work on the code otherwise. You know, this is also built over years, a uh, large piece of spaghetti in my view. Um, there were frameworks that would override things like processes and memory allocation and atomics. Uh, one framework is called WTF, and if you look at it, you indeed think, well, okay. <laughs> um, 
so you have to, your tool needs to be able to work with this and analyze this, uh, preferably before lunch. And then, uh, no, you can go to Samsung, you can go to other companies. This is actually one company's uh, website in static analysis. These are the platforms they support. So the uh, ARM processors, uh, Intel, um, embedded operating systems like QNX, uh, different compilers. Uh, uh, now you have a startup and you want to sell your tool, but you first have to support that full list before you can go to the market. Uh, that's a real challenge. I think our list was about this long. And then once you have your tool, you support all the platforms, then you go to automotive and they say, well, yeah, that's nice, but if we use a tool, then we need to make sure that that tool does what it's promised to do. Otherwise, our developers can't trust it and we fail our certification. Uh, the software needs to be certified. In this case, ISO 26262, uh, functional safety and automotive, which means that if you try to sell a tool, you also have to sell a certification kit with all the right documents that they need to make sure that they use a tool that promises, does what it promises. That costs you a lot of documenting and, and money and all that kind of stuff. And then you've all done all that and you've, you, you sat there, you instrumented the code, it ran, you analyzed, the whole report came out, you look at it with the programmer and you s look at the desk of the programmer and this stands at his desk. I've literally seen this happen once, it's the most spaghetti code I've ever seen. If it, if it was hard to write, it should be hard to understand. And so what does this programmer say? He sees this data race that we just found in the report, data race, variable there and there, there in the code. And he goes like, well, yeah, I've run this a hundred times, this code, and that data race didn't occur. So that must be a false positive of your tool. Huh? Your tool probably doesn't work really right. Uh, my code is fine, no problem. Uh, even though that data race would have literally killed people in the field if it was an X-ray machine, uh, this happened in the 80s, an X-ray machine that had a factor 10 more radiation than normal killed patients uh, because of a data race. Um, yeah, but, but still we have to convince the programmer that actually he made a mistake. So it's a hard sell. So as a takeaway, Everybody who learns concurrency, parallelism, multi-core programming, thinks they understand it, ends up finding mysterious data races and other problems, uh, thought they were impossible. Actually, the guy who said this is the, is the person responsible for tools at Microsoft. It's also the guy who made the C++11 standard, which is the first time that C++ you can actually write these sequentially consistent data race free programs in the standard. Very technical, but it's the first time actually that you can do it right. And at the same time, there's hundreds of millions of lines of code of legacy. And at some point we will have to uh, get back the, the retired persons to service those things. Because today it's still being written. It's not Google Go, it's not Rust, it's not uh, uh, fancy uh, JavaScript stuff. No, it's still this bare bones stuff where you can make all the bad mistakes. And then parallelism can only solve by having tools. Uh, but at the same time, these tools need to operate in such a hugely, insanely complex environment that you can only make a small, a small step. But every small step we make in that real complex environment clearly is uh, improving the landscape and the, and the lives out there with good quality code. Thank you. Thank you, Martijn. Any questions for Martijn? Seeing what you have seen so far. While you think about your questions, I was just wondering, is the world aware of the risks? Or it's not a pretty, pretty picture you're painting. <laughs> Do you think the world is aware of the risks? Well, if you look at a joint strike fighter with 24 million lines of code and that statistics of one in a thousand is a bug, I guess if people would realize that, they wouldn't want to have it fly over their heads. Maybe then it's better that we don't know, right? Yeah. If yeah. I give another example, for instance, a Google Nest, uh, or uh, in Dutch, uh, in the Netherlands, you have Tone, you know, these advanced thermostats. Uh, a little software error in there and your pipes freeze. Another software error that these kind of Heisenbergs are the ones that hackers exploit. They can come in from the outside over the internet and then find out exactly how the thermometer learned when you're not at home and break into your house. 
Uh, that's not a nice picture, but obviously there's lots of development and tools like we do to help him get this to a better level. Sure, yeah, yeah. So was there a lot of competition in the tools that you provided? Well, the parallelization tool that we made at first was to really take existing code and help interactively programmers parallelize it and do it right. And well, we were sort of the only ones in the world doing so, which made it very, very difficult to sell it because nobody would believe that. We managed to optimize the web browser for uh, yeah, companies like Samsung and get it uh, running on four cores in parallel and therefore reducing the battery load four or five X even. And, uh, and they just couldn't believe that. So we had to fly there, demo things and go through all the security and the, the business guards and <laughs> very, very difficult. Could there be an alter alternative motive, ulterior motive not to fix those problems? A cost. Cost. It's all, I mean, obviously. It's, it's, uh, creating 100%, well, 100% not, but high quality software is always possible, but may not be prag uh, pragmatic, may not be realistic in terms of cost or time to market. And that's usually, that's always a trade off. That's very difficult. It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Questions from the audience? Yeah? Did I see a hand there? I saw one there. Over there. I'll be right with you. Sorry. Well, you talked about the C on C++. Um, I'm from that era also, you can see that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I probably know lots of C, but that was at the time that there were no uh, multi-core processors. So um, do you see that also a trend that uh, uh, it's going to higher uh, level programming languages, uh, um, nice. managed uh, code and stuff very, like that? Very good question. Also in those, yeah. in those devices or in that well, so, so what you see is to that, uh, for instance, take C Sharp, which is quite popular in, in that same embedded sort of space. And the large machines like X-ray machines, um, their data races, same story, still happening. Um, things like memory leaks uh, doesn't happen anymore. Pointers, well, uh, yeah, the, the, some of the examples with pointers that you have, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's, that is a clear improvement in the, uh, in the language. Actually, when C and C++ I think the original authors of C and C++ sort of later on realized that they never thought this would grow so big and so popular. But at the same time, if you look at, for instance, the Netherlands, a company that nobody knows about, but it's, it's the world supplier of the machines to make these kind of chips, uh, ASML, uh, in, the, in, the, in the south of Holland, they have about 40 million lines of code. And, uh, and out of that 40 million, I guess something like 30 million is C and C++. That's not going to change that rapidly. New, new starts, they write in C-sharp for that reason. So, yeah, good question. Yes, I am more. Uh, I would like to make a comment on that. Um, sometimes it's necessary to use C or C++ uh, because of performance issues. So I really think uh, you can avoid using it in some places. Um, but I was wondering, um, um, isn't uh, avoiding the issue at all better than curing it with some kind of analytic uh, tool? Uh. Yes, yeah, so uh, it, uh, first of all, you're totally right. So C and C++ are also popular in embedded systems. It's very close to the hardware. And that means that you have the most touches to optimize and know what's going on in the memory system, like for instance I showed earlier. Um, of course, avoiding is better than uh, repairing it after the fact. So we made tools to uh, to analyze code once it's written to get the errors out. That's, that's still earlier than repairing it when it happens in the field. But if you can avoid it from the front and for instance do things like model driven development, which is popular nowadays, where you just basically have a mathematical model that you describe your system in, you can verify that model. For instance, state machines are very popular doing so. And then find, make sure that you don't have data races, deadlocks and things like that. And just press button and generate code and then the generator obviously needs to be checked, but well, if a lot of people use that, that is just bug free, then you can create very high quality code. But typically that only applies in very specific domains. For instance, control and state machines fit with a mathematical model. But if you want to write a video codec, um, doing let's say decoding YouTube videos or, or in your phone or something like that, or a vision system, there's no good mathematical model that applies and therefore that's not possible.
Does it answer your question? Okay. Okay, great. New people have arrived. We already came to the Q&A. Yeah, sorry. Yes, more questions. Have you considered uh, building uh, uh, some of these uh, state machines from the code, uh, from existing C code, like uh, creating something like uh, timed uh, automata or things like that? <laughs> uh, I've been asked to do that. <laughs> um, so no, yeah, it would make sense because indeed with all this legacy, uh, if you could reverse engineer that to get it to a higher level model, and then press the button and generate the right code again, that would be sort of a holy grail in that sense. Um, so what we did in our parallelization pr was to analyze the code, visualize its behavior, and then have the programmer interactively play with the model of that so that he could say, well, what if I would parallelize this? And then the tool would say, well, then your code goes twice as slow. And the programmer goes like, eh, what? And then because there is a data dependency that you need to deal with, and if you don't deal with that, we need to synchronize it, otherwise you get a data race, and uh, that's why it goes slow. And then the programmer goes like, well, oh, I know how to get rid of that. And then you can say, well, then the model would say, well, then it goes on a quad core 3.5 times as fast. And he knows whether it makes sense to do so. But that's, in principle, reverse engineering higher level semantics out of something that's coded at such a low level is, is obviously, yeah, there's no information. So it's a very difficult problem. Yeah. So can we use use machine learning? You know, nowadays we we, we get uh, deep learning in, and can we analyze and find that thing? Actually, there is a U.S. startup that uses machine learning to do static analysis. So uh, go over the code as a reviewer, and then they, uh, the the machine learning at some point recognizes like, hey, here's something that we recognize as being buggy. Let's report that. Um, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But I think there will be new startups doing cool stuff in that area. <laughs> so thank you, Martijn. Please, can I have a loud hand for Martijn? Thank you very much. I hope you all did see the light concerning multi-core programming and, uh, and bug fi fixing.